Hello and welcome to this edition of Wineskins, a program that features reflections on the lives of the saints and sacred scriptures, along with information on topics and issues from a Catholic perspective. I'm Father Jim Cordo. Wineskins is brought to you by the Annual Bishop's Appeal, the Catholic Communication Campaign, and St. Paul's Catholic Books and Gifts, a division of the Society of St. Paul. On our show today, I will interview Father Jay Clark in Part 3 from the television series Spotlight. We will also look at the life of St. Mother Teresa of Calcutta, as well as reflections on the readings for this 22nd Sunday in Ordinary Time. That and more coming up on Wineskins. In our current issue segment, Dr. Pete Schaefer will tell us about evangelization in the Diocese of Youngstown. The Church exists to evangelize, to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Now more than ever, each baptized person needs to fulfill their baptismal calling to follow Christ and share His love, peace, and joy with others. In their document on living as missionary disciples, the United States bishops state that the new evangelization is a call for all of us to have a deeper encounter with Christ best expressed in a simple, confident, informed, and joyous witness to the faith, which attracts others and invites them to wonder what secret is motivating the Christian disciple. Pope Francis, in Joy of the Gospel, reminds us that in our day, Jesus' command to go and make disciples echoes in the challenging scenarios and ever new challenges to the Church's mission of evangelization. And all of us are called to take part in this new missionary going forth. Are you equipped to live the new evangelization? Are you ready to invite others into the adventure of faith in Jesus Christ? Are you prepared to be a missionary disciple? As the Diocese of Youngstown implements the regional plan, it is vitally necessary to focus on evangelization. What can you do to help? The Office of Lay Ministry Formation offers courses to empower faith-filled men and women to serve Christ and His Church. Steeped in Scripture and the tradition of the Church, and geared toward the evangelization of the modern world, the inspiring courses will help you deepen your faith and grow your relationship with God. Courses are designed to help people encounter God anew through study and reflection on Scripture and opportunities for communal prayer. As Christ walked with a community of disciples, forming them for their ministry, lay ministry formation courses provide teachers and companions to learn from and with. The fellowship and encouragement from fellow disciples from a variety of parishes is an integral aspect of the formation. Each session builds upon the last, as you are able to find out ways to evangelize and discern God's will for your further service to your friends, family, parish, and community. The Foundations and Ministry program specifically will begin once again this fall. Foundations and Ministry is a 20-week course in theology, spirituality, and ministry over the course of six months. It is an opportunity to learn the faith on an adult level, discern God's will, and become part of a community of prayer and discussion with other disciples. Foundations in Ministry is offered at three locations, the Ursuline Center in Canfield on Mondays, St. Joseph in Jefferson on Tuesdays, and St. Thomas Aquinas in Louisville on Thursdays. Over 800 people have participated since the program began, finding it a great boost to their life of faith and outreach to others. In addition, the Office of Lay Ministry Formation offers specialized ministry courses on specific ministry topics throughout the year. There are also retreat opportunities. Be sure to check out the webpage for more details. For more information about these programs or to register, please visit our website at www.doy.org and click on Lay Ministry tab under Ministries. Or contact the Office of Lay Ministry Formation at 330-744-8451 or email pschafer at youngstowndiocese.org. Where is God calling you to serve? Join us for Foundations and Ministry to learn more. For Wineskins, I'm Pete Schaefer. This coming Thursday, the Church celebrates the Feast of St. Teresa of Calcutta. To tell us more is Sister Joyce Canditti. She is the Director of the Office for Religious, and a member of the Oblate Sisters of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Born on August 26, 1910, to Albanian parents in what is now Macedonia, Agnes was the youngest of the three children who survived. During her years in public school, Agnes participated in a Catholic sodality and showed a strong interest in the foreign missions. At age 18, she entered the Loretto Sisters in Dublin, 
It was 1928 when she said goodbye to her mother for the final time and made her way to a new land and a new life. The following year, she was sent to the Loreto Novitiate in India. There she chose the name Teresa and prepared for a life of service. She was assigned to a high school for girls in Calcutta, where she taught history and geography to the daughters of the wealthy. But she could not escape the realities around her, the poverty, the suffering, the overwhelming numbers of destitute people. In 1946, Sister Teresa heard what later she explained as a call within a call. The message was clear. I was to leave the convent and help the poor while living among them. She also heard a call to give her life with the Sisters of Loreto and instead to follow Christ into the slums to serve him among the poorest of the poor. After receiving permission to leave Loreto, establish a new community, and undertake her new work, she took a nursing course for several months. She returned to Calcutta, where she lived in the slums and opened a school for poor children. She soon began getting to know her neighbors, especially the poor and sick. The work was exhausting, but she was not alone for long. Volunteers who came to join her in the work, some of them former students, became the core of the Missionaries of Charity. Others helped by donating food, clothing, supplies, and the use of buildings. In 1952, the city of Calcutta gave Mother Teresa a former hostel, which became a home for the dying and the destitute. As the order expanded, services were also offered to orphans, abandoned children, alcoholics, the aging, and street people. For the next four decades, Mother Teresa worked tirelessly on behalf of the poor. Her love knew no bounds. She crisscrossed the globe, pleading for support and inviting others to see the face of Jesus in the poorest of the poor. In 1979, she was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. On September 5, 1997, God called her home. Mother Teresa of Calcutta, the tiny woman recognized throughout the world for her work among the poorest of the poor, was beatified October 19, 2003. Among those present were hundreds of missionaries of charity, the order she founded in 1950 as a diocesan religious community. Today the congregation also includes contemplative sisters and brothers and an order of priests. Speaking in a strained voice at the Beatification Mass, St. Pope John Paul II declared her blessed, prompting waves of applause before the 300,000 pilgrims in St. Peter's Square. In his homily, the Holy Father called Mother Teresa one of the most relevant personalities of our age and an icon of the Good Samaritan. Her life, he said, was a bold proclamation of the gospel. Mother Teresa's beatification, just over six years after her death, was part of an expedited process put into effect by Saint Pope John Paul II. Like so many others around the world, he found her love for the Eucharist, for prayer, and for the poor a model for all to emulate. She was canonized on September 4th, 2016. For Wineskins, I'm Sister Joyce Canditti. I'm talking with Monsignor Jay Clark, and we're celebrating the 75th anniversary of the Diocese of Youngstown. Before we took a break, we were talking, obviously, about Bishop Malone. And one of the things that I recall that many people have remembered was his leadership role in the United States Catholic Conference of Bishops. You were with him during all of that. What do you remember as significant for him in that leadership role? I remember he often said that what was significant that he was the first diocesan bishop that to be elected that was not an archbishop or a cardinal. 
that that was a great affirmation for him. Mm -hmm. And especially after these were several years after he had been living with and recuperating from his you know, original cancer diagnosis. Mm -hmm. To be so much affirmed that he was elected, and I believe it was on the first ballot, that lifted him beyond. And so it, it kind of, you know, it unfolds as that's God's plan. Had he mm -hmm. not been a cancer patient, maybe his name would not have been known the way it was. Mm -hmm. And God's plan unfolds in, in different ways for all of us. It, he didn't flaunt that he was president. He didn't back up from any challenge. And at mm -hmm. that time, when he, they spoke about, they did a document on peace pastoral and on the economics mm -hmm. of the USA. Very challenging topics that some of us just say, oh, well, let's talk about something else. Mm -hmm. But he just dove right in, yeah. surrounded himself. He used the staff at the, at the Washington office mm -hmm. very effectively. and. Very effectively used the staff here at Youngstown. The, the Youngstown staff right. did quite well. You know, yeah. it kind of, you're just proud to be part of that movement of the church. That sure. you know, would that ever happen again? We don't know. What's interesting too is is his role on the national scene also gave encouragement to those of us to also work in national positions mm -hmm. and to use our gifts and talents for the larger church and not just here within the diocese of Youngstown. And how important is that for us to kind of look at the bigger picture of who we are. You know, sometimes when we find ourselves in parish life, we're more focused on what's going on there. We're extremely parochial, but why is it that we need to broaden those horizons and look at the bigger picture and the bigger church? Don't you think that's important? One of the things I think he did effectively, he encouraged all of us priests and supported even, you know, religious and encouraged religious and lay people to do continuing education, ongoing education. You know, encouraged us to do so. He supported the priests that were in high school ministries to go to school in the summertime rather than just fill in in a parish and, and to get, you know, graduate and postgraduate degrees that, that I think helped a lot of people to expand their understanding of who they were, that they could do a lot more than they would have ever have dreamed of doing on their own. And yeah. so I think that was a great, a great asset that he had and, and encouraged his staff to be well informed, to go to conferences, to cooperate. We all had our corresponding figures in, in the Columbus Catholic Conference of mm -hmm. Ohio, and he encouraged priests to take active roles in local ministerial association, and mm -hmm. he would actually ask if they were doing this just to keep the, sure. to keep the challenge going. And yeah. So he, he constantly challenged himself and challenged others as well. And I think all that ongoing education had a lot to improve the quality of parish life in our diocese. Mm. It, and I think another facet of, at least of his encouragement, was that whole ecumenical spirit and attitude. You had mentioned uh, previously of his desire to witness and also to collaborate with members of other Christian denominations and how important that aspect really is presently in our diocesan church mm -hmm. through his efforts. Why is that important for us to continue those efforts? Well, we're celebrating what started in those years in our local communities that now the parishes and, and the clergy, the denominations, we much more easily and really you know, contact one another and we've got a common witness mm -hmm. that we didn't have before. That's happening on, also on the national level because you know, the, the, the major dialogues with the major Christian denominations, that there's a lot more agreement than mm -hmm. there ever was. And it wasn't too many years ago when you, know, you didn't step your foot inside a Protestant sure. church and they didn't come to Catholic churches. Mm -hmm. And so there's just an at ease and a comfortableness with who we all are because we took time to get to know each other. And that was his, that's one of his goals was to do that. And he did that on the level of, of judicatory heads, they call it, like mm -hmm. bishop to bishop, bishop to conference head. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then it trickled down. Yeah. And he was a planner too. I mean, he was an organized person and a planner and always looking ahead. And, and as I reflect on our Dosses and theme for this anniversary is we certainly have pride in the past, but we have faith in the future. And that means that we have some plan. Mm -hmm. Why is it important for us to plan? And how did this all come out through Bishop Malone? He had an agenda and a book that he lived by, you know, and I'll call it his appointment book that mm -hmm. we didn't have, you know, devices in those days right. to, to do that. But he just surrounded himself with people that, that think creatively. And then he said, well, let, let's try to do something like that. So I, he, yes, he did plan. He caught, he was able to catch the spirit of other people, put it with his and take us all forward. You know, we had a couple studies, parish study, and even as when it looked like the decline of clergy was beginning to happen, he was not afraid to look at that. And then he got us looking at it too. And we've had some major, or the diocesan 
they had annualist five years. Like a synod or? Yes, yeah, synods. Yes. That he promoted those. And mm-hmm. so the new approach was, let's, let's get grassroots before we get the decisions made. He mm-hmm. was, mm-hmm. yeah, he had a mind that worked. And the other interesting thing in our last few minutes of our time together was his desire to get the laity involved in the life of the church. Mm-hmm. You know, he was wonderful with people. When you mentioned Bishop Malone's name in your parish, there was always a, a, an excitement or a vibrancy or a desire to look forward to him being there or his mm-hmm. presence. And he always greeted people very graciously and very well. What does that do for us or what does that tell us, especially as we experience life in our own parishes and communities and institutions, how important that is to have that involvement of the lay people? I think the involvement with lay people starts with hospitality and he can make anybody at ease and feel welcome. He most often knew your name. He remembered something about you that he could remember years later you know, that, that he would be able to bring up in conversation and set the other people at ease. And so when he was at a gathering, he would work the room. I'm going to use that. You know, he's not running for anything, right. but he would not just sit at a table and wait for people to come up to him. He would go around and make sure that people saw that he was there. And so they felt, yeah, I'm, I'm important. He saw me. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, that's part of where we're always encouraged now to bring back the people we've lost is to strive to be hospitable. Mm-hmm. That we, we didn't have to do that for so many years because we were in our ghetto churches. Right. But now we're in you know, suburbs and big cities, and we've got to work to let people know that they are welcome and that they are important. And I think he did that in an exceptionally fine way. And wonderful words to live by, for yeah. sure. Unfortunately, have to close our, our program together. Thank you for your time here on Spotlight, but also for the very intimate, personal reflections that you had about one of the significant leaders in our diocesan church, Bishop Malone. Okay, thank and thank you for your ministry uh, these many years. And God bless you and Godspeed. Thank you. I've been looking forward to being here and glad I came. Thank you. And thank you for being with us. Have a good day and God be with you. Visit the website of the Catholic Diocese of Youngstown at www.doi.org. Stay with us. We'll be back in a moment. Christopher Minutes. Thoughts on making every day count. Here's Monsignor Jim Lasanti. Michael Applebaum and Corinne Rambeau fell in love as seniors attending Lexington High School in Massachusetts. But the young woman was a French exchange student and went home at the end of the year. After finishing their education, Michael pursued a career as a concert violinist and Corinne became an attorney. When Corinne returned to the United States almost a decade later, she called her old friend. This time, everything was right. A year later, Michael Applebaum moved to Paris. The couple is now married and the parents of two sons. It had to happen this way, says Corinne. She believes their time apart gave them the necessary maturity to make their marriage work. My friends, not all goodbyes are forever. Once in a while, life gives us a second chance that may be even better than the first. I'm Monsignor Jim Losanti. Make this a great day. Church World Service believes that being self-reliant is a joy everyone should share. So around the block or around the world, share the joy. The song we have for you today is from the CD called Tender Hearted. It is by Gene Cotter and courtesy of GIAMusic.com.
And to tell us about the scriptures for this 22nd Sunday in Ordinary Time is Father Sean Conaboy. A few years ago, a seminary classmate and I went to the ordination of a bishop. We were also invited to the reception. Of course, there were many people at the reception, really more people than there were seats. And that was fine because the food was being served buffet style. We could just stand and chat as we got our appetizers. Well, as it turned out, my classmate and I didn't know many of the other guests there. So while we were in line for appetizers, we chatted with the other guests near us. Eventually, we needed to sit down to eat the entree. Looking around, we saw no empty seats at the tables, except at one table with only two open seats. As we approached the table, we saw some of the people that we were talking with earlier in the evening as we were in line. So we asked if we could sit there. The whole table welcomed us, but as we were sitting, we noticed the little sign that read, Reserved. Hesitant to be sitting at a table with some close friends of the newly ordained bishop, but encouraged by their welcome, we sat and ate. Everyone at the table talked to us. The conversation was pleasant and engaging. These honored guests were very gracious to us. They made us feel more than welcome. The Gospel today speaks about honored guests sitting at a table. Throughout our lives, in many ways, we approach the Lord's table. The celebration that the Lord is inviting us to is wonderful and joyful and grand. The letter to the Hebrews describes it as a place with angels and festal gathering. Again, throughout our lives, we approach the Lord in his glory. At Mass, we approach Jesus Christ in the Eucharist. But before we do, we say, Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof. Each time we recognize the distance between where we are, where we are called to be, and where we are. We recognize the ideal for our lives and the struggle that we face to reach that ideal. We recognize the holiness of God and the iniquity of ourselves. God has set a table for us, but we seem to see a little sign that says reserved. We hesitate to sit down, acknowledging our unworthiness. And we ask the Lord to speak a word of healing. We say, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. The Lord doesn't just invite us to sit at the table. He doesn't just welcome us. He heals us. The Lord sets the table and he says the word of healing. The reserved sign disappears. We are not just welcome to sit in a place of honor. We are made equal with our Lord, the host. The reason for discomfort is erased. The Lord pronounces the healing word, and we become worthy to share in the Lord's life. The glory, the greatness, the holiness of God is ours. Even though our lives are transformed at Mass, we daily seek the healing word of Jesus. Somehow, the discomfort of being at the Lord's table reappears in our lives time and again. Despite being welcomed, we can feel like we are at the wrong table. We should not run away, though. The discomfort should not discourage us. Instead, the discomfort can lead us to a more worthy life. The readings today encourage us to humility and generosity and wisdom. There are many ways that we can grow in our Christian lives, celebrating the sacraments, the Eucharist, reconciliation, building community, prayer, helping others. And of course, as we grow, the more comfortable we become with the Lord. The Gospel today ends with the reminder that sometimes we are the host. We invite guests to the Lord's table. But Christian humility means that we do not see ourselves as honored guests, accepting the presence of less worthy ones. Christian humility means that we see everyone, including especially ourselves, as unworthy, and that we see everyone as receiving the healing word of Jesus. We are not at a reserved table. There is no one less worthy than ourselves. In the Eucharist, we thank the Lord that we are called to the Supper of the Lamb. We thank Him for speaking His healing word. We thank Him that we can all share in the celebration. For Wineskins, I'm Father Sean Conaboy. We may or may not have prestige in the eyes of others, but Jesus has the only vote that counts, and His word on the subject is this. The one that humbles himself will be exalted. That's the true way to be important. Wineskins is made possible through the annual Bishop's Appeal, the Catholic Communication Campaign, and St. Paul's Catholic Books and Gifts. The program is produced by CTNY, the Catholic Telecommunications Network of Youngstown. I'm Father Jim Porta, saying thank you for being with us, and have a blessed week.
What have you done for your marriage today? I gave my wife a hug this morning. I thought uh, I love her. I uh, did her hair this morning. I think it looks pretty good. <laughs> I cooked my husband's uh, favorite breakfast. I bought her an orchid. What have I done for my marriage today? I sent my husband a love email. I read the newspaper to my wife and it cracked her up. She's, but she's still laughing. <laughs> what have you done for your marriage today? Make a change for the better. Need help? Go to foryourmarriage.org. A message from the Catholic Church. They say America is the land of opportunity, but for some, life isn't so easy. Right now in America, one in six children lives below the poverty line. That's nearly 13 million children of all races all across our country. Where do you draw the line and get involved? You can make a difference in more ways than you think. Go to povertyusa.org today, because one in six children in poverty is one too many. A message from the Catholic Campaign for Human Development.